it's not to say that there's one right way to do things. We are very much in a gray area where a lot of things are still unknown. It's not to say that there is a formula or absolute answers. It's to equip you with the knowledge to take a more educated approach when planning your interval training. The Triathlon Show 146. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, we get into part two of the deep dive into the design of interval training. I'll try to, again, answer the not-so-easy question of how to get the most out of your interval workouts by using smart workout design a knowledge of physiology and your individual goals and targets with each workout to get the most out of your training time. But first, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. I want to wish a big congratulations to Andy Blow, who is the founder of Precision Hydration. He just competed in the Ötile Swim Run World Championships in Sweden, Together with Paul Newsom, you've heard both Andy and Paul on the show before. Ötile, the World Championship course in Sweden, is 75 kilometers long, consisting of 10 kilometers of swimming in total and 65 kilometers of running, the longest run segment of, I think it's roughly 15 or 20 run segments and as many swims. The longest run is a half marathon, and it's it's trail running mostly, so it's uh, pretty extreme, which, of course means that you have to be very, very particular about nutrition and hydration. And Precision Hydration functions as uh, the selected provider of hydration for Ötile races, not just the World Championships, but all their Ötile series races. And uh, this is uh, just one more piece of proof in the pudding that Precision Hydration is a company that you can count on to get uh, the best quality products that keep you hydrated uh, in the, the most extreme circumstances. You can get your first box of Precision Hydration Electrolyte products for free on precisionhydration.com when you use the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. And uh, I highly recommend that you first take their free online sweat test and that way you can find out what hydration or electrolyte strength you need for your individual sweat sodium content and sweat rate. And this episode is also sponsored by Roka. We just, by the time of this recording, and also by the time of you listening to this, have just seen a very, very interesting 70.3 World Championship race in South Africa. Especially the men's side was super exciting. And uh, next up is Kona. That's the big one. It's coming up soon. We will soon have the World Championships on the Ironman distance here. Many of you listeners might be going to the age group races, and as all of you probably know, Kona is a non-wetsuit swim. And the participants that want to, want to be as fast as possible in the water choose to wear a swim skin to uh, at least get some benefit from what they're wearing in the water. In 2015 was the last official swim skin count, and Roka had more swim skins than any other brand in the race, despite being only a couple of years into their business at that point. And there hasn't been an official count since then, but Roka do their own unofficial count every year, and uh, they are by far the most widely used brand based on those unofficial counts as well. The Viper swim skin is constructed with a big focus on every and attention to every single detail, from using the world's fastest materials in the water with the least drag, to low profile zippers and hidden stitch reinforcement to make sure that you get every second out of your performance. You can get 20% off the Viper swim skin or any other Roka product, your entire order, on roka.com, that's R O K A.com, using the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. All right, so a little bit of background about this episode. It is part two, as I said, part one was in episode 139. And uh, we've also interviewed Paul Larson on this very topic. That was in episodes 128 to 129, episode, an episode series called Interval Training, Science and Application. 
And uh, Paul Larson, together with uh, Martin Boucher, they have published a two-part review paper that is called High Intensity Interval Training, Solutions to the Programming Puzzle, where part one is called Cardiopulmonary Emphasis and part two is called Anaerobic Energy, Neuromuscular, Neuromuscular Load and Practical Applications. And part one is what we covered in uh, episode 139, or I covered, and uh, part two is what I will cover today. So let's just dive right in. So first, let me start by reading an extract from the very end of the article, actually. But this is uh, very, very, very well written, in my opinion. And I want to highlight why this episode and uh, part one was important. Uh, the authors write, choosing the best solution to such a puzzle might be analogous to how an admiral goes about deciding which operation is best suited to take out a given military target. While mass destruction weapons might hit all targets at once, i.e. running hard for a few minutes will do the job. Collateral damage often occurs, analogous to extra fatigue, more injury and illness. Sometimes then, the best solution might involve specific US Navy SEAL uh, type operations for more specific targeting of the required physiological capacities, but with less risk of collateral damage. So this is what uh, this episode and also part one was about. It's not to say that there's one right way to do things. We are very much in a gray area where a lot of things are still unknown. It's not to say that there is a formula or absolute answers. It's to equip you with the knowledge to take a more educated approach when planning your interval training. So just to give you a quick recap, in part one we discussed how to optimize intervals from a cardiopulmonary, in other words, oxygen uptake and utilization or VO2 perspective. It's your, your respiratory and your circulatory systems, your heart and lungs and blood vessels. And that aspect is the most important aspect. It's more important than what we'll talk about today. But uh, today is uh, not unimportant by any means. Uh, it's uh, part two today and we'll discuss the secondary factors for which you can optimize. And these secondary factors are anaerobic energy contribution and neuromuscular and musculoskeletal load. So as I said, it is important, although not as important as the VO2 perspective. But if you have two equally good workouts from a VO2 perspective, then these secondary factors should uh, probably be what makes you decide between them for which one uh, is right for you and your particular goals with any given workout. Number one on the list of things that we'll discuss is the impact that uh, the work and rest interval intensity and duration has on the anaerobic energy contribution. So uh, if you extend the interval duration uh, of a workout without changing the rest interval duration, then this uh, is uh, very clear what happens. It increases the anaerobic energy contribution from the anaerobic glycolytic system because you have to complete more work in a given time period. The same applies if you keep the work duration fixed. So let's say you keep your intervals at two minutes, but instead of two minute intervals, you shorten the uh, rest intervals, you shorten the rest intervals to one minute. So the same thing happens, more anaerobic energy is used. If you maintain the same work to rest ratio, so for example, you always have a one to one ratio, then increasing the length of the intervals also very likely, based on what we know, increases the anaerobic glycolytic energy contribution. So if you, for example, go from one minute on, one minute off, to two minutes on, two minutes off at your VO2 max intensity, then this will lead to a substantial increase in anaerobic glycolytic energy release. And uh, there's a caveat here. If you work very far below your VO2 max, then this is not necessarily the case, but uh, you shouldn't do that, as we talked about in part one. Usually you will be at the least at 90% of your VVO2 max, so your velocity at VO2 max, if not 95%, to, uh, even, and that's if you have long intervals. So for example, to illustrate with what some studies have shown, there was a study that compared the interval uh, duration when you ran, the runners ran at 100%, so at their v, VO2 max, and they changed the interval, compared the interval durations of 2 minutes 10 seconds with 2 minutes 30 seconds, 
with a work relief ratio of one to two. And uh, so that's not a big change. That's a 20 second increase in the interval duration and the same work rest ratio was kept. But still it resulted in an almost twofold increase in the initial rate of blood lactate accumulation. And blood, the rate of blood lactate accumulation simply means how fast does the amount of lactate in your blood, blood <laughs> ramp up. And in the, this paper, they have defined it during five minutes. Sometimes it's not measured in papers, of course, but it can be extrapolated and estimated. So, so in this case, the two minutes, 10 second intervals had a rate of lactate accumulation of six millimoles per liter of blood per five minutes. And this same number was 10 when you went to two minute 30 second intervals. And also the blood lactate measurements at the end of the session were very, very significantly different with 8.8 .8 at the end of uh, the two minute 30 second interval workout and only 4.8. So just above what's typically considered your lactate threshold at around four millimoles uh, in uh, the two minute 10 second interval workout. So very big difference. Short intervals, which uh, if, if you remember, we defined as one minute or less in duration are less anaerobic than longer intervals. Since at the beginning of every such interval, you will use stored oxygen before the respiratory and circulatory systems need to start to ramp up when that stored oxygen uh, runs out or is uh, no longer enough. So, but this of course is still dependent on that you run these shorter intervals at the intensity that is prescribed. So usually, if you recall, we talked about this, the optimal intensity of these short intervals being in the 100 to 110, maybe 120% of your VVO2 max. So not that much faster than your longer two or three minute intervals should be. A little bit, yeah, but not that much. And uh, then you instead have to compensate with doing more of them. But uh, if you start to sprint in these short intervals, then of course it will be more anaerobic because you will run out of that stored oxygen very quickly. But if you stick to the prescribed ideal intensities, then short intervals is a good way to use less anaerobic energy. In long intervals, the recoveries that we use, as we talked about last time, is uh, often passive recoveries to maximize the time that you can spend at intensity. Whereas in short intervals, uh, we typically would use an active recovery at maybe 50 to 70% of VVO2 max, because otherwise you will have uh, not get as good a time at VO2 max accumulated. So, uh, and even though some studies have shown that this active recovery, it does increase the anaerobic energy contribution compared to having a passive recovery. I think when we return to the previous episode and the, the VO2 max consideration, you have to make this compromise. So you should still keep that active recovery, even though the anaerobic energy contribution is higher. And uh, so let's talk a little bit more about when and why you would want a workout to be more or less anaerobic. So use more or less anaerobic energy. First of all, um, high, highly anaerobic energy workouts or workouts with high anaerobic energy contribution, they're often, often called uh, lactic workouts they are often perceived as harder. And this is very important to note because if you feel like you're working hard every damn day, then you're going to struggle, uh, or even if it's just every every workout day. But if you feel that some of your workouts, hard workouts are hard, but more sustainable, then it makes you that more likely to stick with it for a long time and, and improve more over the long haul. So it is important to not do all of your workouts as high lactic workouts because of that perceived fatigue and per perceived effort that you need to put into them. Also, when you need to recover quickly and you need to restore your glycogen stores quickly, uh, you want to choose workouts that are less glycolytic, less anaerobic. So choose short intervals. It's simple as that. An example of this is when you're approaching taper, you may still want to keep intensity. Uh, I highly recommend that to keep some intensity in your taper but do it in form of shorter intervals like this and not longer intervals. And, uh, but on the other hand, when you want to actually train your ability to use anaerobic energy and uh, tolerate that buildup that you experience, for example, if you're focusing on sprint distance triathlons, 
or maybe you're an advanced athlete and you're focusing on Olympic distance uh, triathlons, but you're running your 10K at uh, your anaerobic threshold or higher, so there will be an anaerobic contribution, a significant anaerobic contribution, then you want to do some of your sessions that are uh, intended to actually work that glycolytic anaerobic system very hard. And so choose those workouts, choose those longer intervals. Uh, that might be something that you do a bit earlier and not in taper, uh, of course. And also consider what you have coming up. Like if you need to recover quickly for a hard bike ride the next day, perhaps, then maybe choose a shorter, like a one minute on, one minute off type workout. But if you have an easy day the rest day, then maybe you can do the, those two minutes on, two minutes off, or even three minutes on, three minutes off. So those are some consideration. And that was uh, tip number one. So number two on the list is uh, the workout modality and how that affects the anaerobic energy contribution. This is a short one, but there was a study that we actually mentioned in the previous episode as well, where elite French middle distance runners, uh, they did two workouts, one on uh, the track and it was uh, 600 meters, six times 600 meters. So they did that in one minute, 40 seconds. And then they did a six times 500 meters on the road, on, on a hilly road or a sloping road uphill. So the same time duration was used. And they found that the blood lactate accumulation, which is uh, what is pretty much all, all the time used to estimate how much anaerobic energy is used in these workouts, that was much higher after the track version of the workout compared to the, uh, the hill uh, session. So after the track workout, the lactate was on average 13.2 millimoles, millimoles per liter. And after the, the hill workout, it was 8.5. And there were the same number of reps, same recovery durations and uh, the same duration of the intervals. So, so this is a big, big difference. But remember, as we discussed in uh, the previous episode, that the time at VO2 max was also lower for this session when done uphill on the road compared to on the track. So here is where you need to make a trade-off between how, what you want to get out of the workout. Like, do you really want to optimize for VO2 max? Then you might want to go to the track. But uh, if you, are, if you are make, want to make sure that you don't use too much anaerobic energy and, and you still want to get out a good, good workout in, then it's not a bad workout to do this uphill either, but uh, not necessarily as good from a VO2 max perspective as on the track. But in that case, when you prioritize not having as anaerobic a session, then maybe do this workout uphill. And uh, item number three on our list to go through. I'm just scrolling to a table here in the original paper. Uh, so uh, this is basically uh, a few examples of the anaerobic uh, energy contribution of uh, a few select, uh, select workouts that the authors have listed in a table. It's uh, table three in the paper that I'll of course link to in the show notes. And uh, so just to give you a few ideas here, uh, it's actually table number two. Sorry, I was mistaken, table number two. So if you have uh, long intervals, but that are less than two minutes in duration, then the initial rate of blood lactate accumulation during five minutes is five millimoles per liter per five minutes with that kind of workout. And that's a moderate rate of lactate accumulation. Actually, it's even like fairly high, mo moderate plus, I would say maybe, depending on how what you what you compare it to. But, but that gives you a baseline. If you compare that with uh, intervals that are three minutes or longer, at uh, the same intensity, pretty much, again, with passive recoveries, then that uh, rate of blood lactate accumulation is five to seven millimoles per liter per five minutes. Compare that to short intervals, for example, intervals that are uh, longer than 20 seconds at uh, less than 100% of v VO2 max with uh, a relief duration that is the same as the work duration uh, and uh, active recovery in that case then the expected initial rate of blood lactate accumulation is less than five. That's all that's stated, not any particular number, but the same goes for short intervals that are 30 seconds or 50, 15 seconds, uh, etc. So, so this gives you an idea of uh, what the range of uh, blood lactate accumulation rates are. And also 
a particular kind of uh, workout that's also referenced throughout this uh, article is, for example, sprint interval training. So 20 to 30 seconds all out with uh, uh, usually four minutes or five minutes passive recovery. When in for this type of workout, doing those like those, let's say it's a 30 second sprint, and then you recover for four minutes, the rate of blood lactic accumulation is larger than 10 in, in the initial onset. So this makes it highly anaerobic with that rate. And the same goes for repeated, repeated sprint training. That is another type of more team sport relevant interval training with very short sprints and very short recoveries. So that's why I don't talk about them that much in, in this podcast series. But this gives you an idea of the example sessions. So just to recap, three minute long intervals, five to seven millimoles per liter per five minutes, two minute or shorter long intervals, roughly five millimoles per liter per five minutes, uh, short intervals, less than one minute, uh, around 30 seconds maybe, definitely less than five millimoles per liter per five minutes. Item number four is uh, we're moving to neuromuscular load and the effect of the parameters of short and long intervals. First, let's quickly define neuromuscular load. It refers to the various physical stressors that uh, your anatomy encounters during a workout and uh, the acute effects that this has on both your neuromuscular and your musculoskeletal systems. So this includes your muscles, tendons, joints and bone. And, uh, and also in terms of the neuromuscular performance, it's the muscle fiber recruitment and, and other changes in their uh, functionality, basically. So it's, uh, there may be some neural adjustments and changes in force generation capacity that goes on there. So one example study that I, uh, that I want to point out here compared one minute on, one minute off, compared with two minutes on, two minutes off at VVO2 max and how that affected a counter movement jump height. And that is a very common test to, to test for neuro, neuromuscular uh, capacity, basically. And there was no difference between these two types of intervals, one minute on, one minute off, versus two minutes on, two minutes off. Uh, so, but also these workouts generated similar uh, lactate at the end of workout and similar running speed actually in the workout themselves. And we know that muscle function impairment is often associated with lactate values larger than 10 millimoles at the end of the workout. And in this case, the lactate at the end of the workout was 8.8. So this could be the reason. And maybe if we would have compared two minutes on, two minutes off with three minutes on, three minutes off, we might have seen a larger difference in that the three minutes on would have been significantly worse. There have been no direct comparison between long and short intervals. So uh, short intervals, again, being less than one minute in duration. Uh, but uh, we think, or the authors think, that the acute neuromuscular load may be greater with short intervals actually compared to long intervals for the following reasons. And uh, the first one is that the work intensity is generally higher with shorter intervals. So again, now we're not comparing two minutes and three minutes because those are both long intervals, but we're comparing, for example, two minutes with 30 second intervals. Uh, and the second reason is that short intervals require, since you do a lot of them, it requires you to accelerate frequently and also decelerate and uh, re-accelerate. So, so this adds a lot of extra force because whenever you need to accelerate, Newton's second law, for those of you who remember your high school physics, requires you to use more force, use more power, use more energy. So the authors uh, believe that this may uh, tax the neuromuscular system and the musculoskeletal system more due to these accelerations and uh, decelerations. Just to give you an example, if you're doing short intervals that are to be completed at a speed of 120% of your VVO2 max, then actually since you are accelerating at the start of those intervals, and uh, maybe even decelerating a bit at the end, then your max speed during those intervals may be 135% of your VVO2 max. So that, that starts to approach your sprint speed and this taxes the neuromuscular system a lot because the engagement of the neuromuscular system is so high. So this is why this should be considered when you're doing short intervals that it can add extra neuromuscular load. And you need to consider that also from an injury management perspective. 
the authors also go on to say that uh, there is likely a bell-shaped relationship between the intensity uh, of a session and the acute neuromuscular performance, so right after the exercise, with uh, too low uh, intensity, not having enough uh, stimulus to actually improve neuromuscular performance, because some workouts may improve neuromuscular performance, and too high have detrimental effects. So basically what they go on to say is that if you do intervals at an intensity of larger than 80 to 85 percent of vvo2 max so around that anaerobic threshold or higher then that requires recruit enough recruitment of fast twitch fibers that uh, you may experience post activation potentiation of that neuromuscular system which can actually lead to long-term structural adaptations that allow fatigue resistance to high-speed running uh, but if you do very high intensities, like larger than 120% of VVO2 max, then that's likely associated with acute impairments in muscular performance. And also the residual fatigue may be greater, although we don't really know how much. There is l very limited data documenting the recovery course and how the residual fatigue develops uh, from a neuromuscular perspective following, following intervals. But these, in essence, are the things to consider when it comes to the parameters of your intervals in terms of the neuromuscular and musculoskeletal load. Number five on our list is how intensity and hill running affect, affect your musculoskeletal load. In terms of intensity, we know that, uh, especially for runners that are not like elite or sub-elite, Selecting a running intensity or workout intensity that is slightly less, like uh, let's say 90 to 95% of your VVO2 max, that still allows for you to reach your VO2 max intensity. Again, since it's not we're not talking elite athletes here, then that can be a safer option from an injury management and musculoskeletal load perspective compared to selecting like 100% of VVO2 max, even if that would uh, theoretically be possible for these athletes as well. In terms of uh, the terrain, hills or flats like track, that same study with the elite French mid-distance runner, they also compared this in terms of the musculoskeletal load and uh, the results they got from that study was showed that the stride parameters changed in a way that suggests that uh, there was lesser ham hamstring loading when running uphill compared to running on the track. Another study actually measured your quad and hamstring activation, and they found that the hamstrings were less activated when running uphill, but the quads were the same compared to running on the track or on the flat road. So these studies, together with some others, suggest that running uphill, that uh, lowers the strain on the hamstrings in runners, which could be beneficial to prevent injuries during maximal and or high volume sessions. Uh, however, do take into account that there is potential muscle damage and risk from running downhill, especially the harder you run downhill, the harder it, the bigger this risk become, becomes. And uh, just a side note, anecdotally, the only time that I've been even close to having a hamstring strain was actually during a hill interval session, but take that for what it is, <laughs> very much an anecdote. So number seven is uh, example sessions and uh, their impact on the neuromuscular and musculoskeletal load. So this is the next table in the paper that uh, I said that I'll link to. Uh, it's table number three that I was uh, mistakenly looking at last time. So just to give you some ideas, if we have long intervals that are uh, at 95% or more of VVO2 max, two to three minutes, I ran on the track with a relief duration of 45 minutes at passive recovery, so 60 to 70% of VVO2 max. Then the injury risk level is rated as a, a plus two for traumatic injuries, like acute injuries, and plus three for overuse injuries. And that is the maximum rating here. It goes from minus three, which would, would indicate like a, a no, not, not at all uh, injury, risk level to plus three, which indicates like very big risk. In terms of the acute change in muscular performance, neuromuscular performance, it is uh, uh, from, from improved one plus to impaired one plus. So some change, but it can go both ways really. And uh, if we compare that to 
uh, running uphill for two to three minutes with two minute relief duration passive, the same acute change in muscular performance is shown. But when we look at the injury risk levels, the traumatic injury risk, instead of being a plus two, which is a, a high risk, it is a minus one. So, so a low risk of traumatic injury. The overuse injury risk is still there at a plus two, but it's better than the plus three that, was, uh, that we had for the track workout. And if we go to the short intervals, for example, let's uh, look at an example that is running for uh, 20 seconds or less on an indoor track. Uh, at 110% or less of VVO2 max with less than 20 second passive recoveries, uh, then the injury risk is for traumatic injuries is minus one. So not, uh, no, no, not a big injury risk, but whereas the overuse injury risk, not a big traumatic injury risk, I should say, but the overuse injury risk is a plus two. So because this is a, a long series of intervals, so you need to do quite a lot of total work. So that's uh, the rationale there. So actually now I need to correct myself immediately. I said that plus three was the largest. I guess that plus five is maybe the largest or plus four because I see that when I scroll down to the sprint interval training, again, those 30 seconds all out and then four minutes passive recovery or five minutes passive recovery, they have a traumatic injury risk of plus four for the hamstring in particular. And uh, the neuromuscular performance is from is impaired with a rating of plus two to plus four for that. So that is uh, the examples of how different workouts affect neuromuscular and musculoskeletal load. Number seven is slightly off topic, but uh, it is important. It's something that interests me a lot. And when I came across it uh, in basically in passing in the article, I, I found it uh, useful enough that I wanted to include it here, even though it's not necessarily directly related to, to this topic of designing internal workouts. Uh, but it is about how you how you are affected by your workouts. So it's about peripheral versus central fatigue. And uh, just uh, in case you are not aware, per aware, peripheral fatigue means fatigue in the working muscles, for example, in your leg muscles. So this depends on things like the, uh, uh, the muscle excitability, which depends on excitation, contraction, coupling, which is related to things like like the potassium concentration and disturbances in that, and also accumulation of metabolic byproducts in the muscles. And central fatigue, on the other hand, is, is more, it's in your central nervous system and has to do with the communication from the central nervous system uh, to, to the muscles at, at a more central level. So this can affect, even if you work out with only your legs, central fatigue can affect uh, your your arm muscles when you, when you go to a swim. Uh, so... You, it's always a spectrum. It's not a black and white that you have one or the other, of course. But uh, but in terms of how different internal workouts affect uh, or cause peripheral versus central fatigue, um, short and long intervals uh, are usually causing more peripheral and not so much central fatigue as long as they are non-maximal effort. So, for example, less than 120% of your v VO2 max. But when the speed gets very high, like higher than that 120, and especially things like sprint interval training, those 30, 20 to 30 seconds all out sprints, those are usually reported to be uh, more associated with, uh, with central fatigue rather than uh, peripheral fatigue. So the practical application of this is that, let's say you have a hard run and the next day or even the same day you want to do a hard swim. That That is possible, but uh, not if you induce central fatigue, because that will affect your ability to do a hard swim. So then you need to select a workout that does not induce central fatigue, which in practical terms, as long as you stay away from those very large velocities, then you should be fine and induce more peripheral fatigue, which you would still probably be able to do a hard swim on. Of course, this all depends on how hard the workout is. There, There is no black and white here that you always will be able to do that. I certainly know that after some run workouts, even though they are not uh, super high velocity, I feel like I won't be able to swim for three days after them. But uh, that in, on paper, this is the way it works. So I'm definitely going to discuss the topic of central and peripheral fatigue more in some future episodes, perhaps do an interview with some expert that I can find on them. But uh, so if you know somebody, put us in touch. But for now, 
this short explanation will have to do and uh, now you know a little bit about how you can plan your interval training for central and peripheral fatigue. Number eight, we're approaching here the most interesting part of all. Uh, this is the programming considerations of your high intensity intervals. So we have two general rules basically to guide your selection of intervals. Uh, the first is that uh, the, set, the, the acute metabolic and neuromuscular response of the workout should be in line with uh, your targets, your physiological needs and where you are in your season. And the second rule that you need to follow is that you need to consider the time that you need to recover from that session. And this needs to be from the lens of what, uh, what other workouts you need to fit into the puzzle. So that's uh, why this uh, paper, this review paper is aptly called the solving the programming puzzle. And that's something that we could talk for hours and hours about. And uh, so we won't talk about that at all. You need to decide what are your goals with the session based on what your ultimate race goals are what you're trying to improve right now, etc., and how you need to recover based on how you have prioritized your workouts for that week. Uh, and if we talk a little bit about how to place your intro workouts in a program, so a good general recommendation is to separate them by two days. An example study that looked at endurance athletes with uh, uh, run runners that had a VO2 max of 20.5 kilometers per hour, so that's a three minute pace, uh, per kilometer, which is uh, very fast. They repeated three intervals sessions per week of five times three minutes at their VO2, VVO2 max with three minute recoveries at 50% of VVO2 max. So three of those per week for four weeks. And after that, they showed early signs of overtraining uh, with uh, increased ratings of fatigue, muscle soreness, and poor sleep quality. How this applies to triathlon is not clear. I think it's obvious to most of us that for most athletes with a bit more experience, at least some points in the season, you do at least one uh, high intensity interval session per discipline per week with great success usually. So we don't really know how this rule of thumb affects the fact that you do interval workouts in different disciplines. And if we look at uh, something like swimming, for example, most successful athletes do a lot of intro work for swimming. And that's the way I coach personally as well. When I have more experienced athletes, they do a lot of intro work and see great results on that type of work. So, so I don't think that you should take this with a great grain of salt because the studies that have been done have been done in single sport athletes, athletes and running in particular is uh, something that takes a long time to recover from compared to swimming, for example, in general. So that's why that's separate by two days. Uh, I think I think it's clear that for runners, it is a good rule of thumb, but for triathletes, you need to find what works for you. Uh, but uh, consider the fact that the more, uh, the more lactic, the more anaerobically taxing a workout is, and we talked about that earlier, that doesn't mean shorter and faster necessarily. That means long three minute intervals are, for example, very anaerobic. They will require more more recovery because of the fact that you deplete your glycogen stores uh, a lot from them. And sorry for jumping back and forth a little bit here, but I just had uh, a second point about uh, triathlon and uh, doing intervals in three different disciplines. The fact that we do have to fit in interval work in three different disciplines, that makes it even more important for us to plan our sessions with minimal collateral damage. So for example, a runner, if they're going to take 48 hours anyway before their next session, then it may be fine for them to induce central fatigue or really deplete their glycogen stores. They have time to recover from that. But if we do that and then we have a, a hard swim the next day, then even if our arms are fine, our shoulders are fine, if we completed completely uh, run ourselves low on glycogen and we have induced some form of central fatigue, then that's going to affect the, the next interval session so much which is why I think it's very important to be aware of all of these things that we're discussing in this episode and in episode 139. So item number nine is uh, a bit of a special treat. It's uh, programming with uh, the Thibault model. And this is something that I can't really explain in detail over audio. There is a great figure in the paper that is open access. So I'll link to that in the show notes again. Uh, but uh, the Fibolt model basically 
is a chart where on the x-axis you have the work interval duration and on the y-axis you have the number of repetitions. Then you have uh, several different uh, lines or curves on that chart area. Each curve corresponds to a specific intensity in the percent of uh, VVO2 max. And uh, you have uh, points dotted on those curves and they all are basically ISO RPE curves. So each of those points on those, so sorry, ISO RPE points, each of those points plotted are supposed to be equally taxing. So you can compare, for example, now I'm going to bring, get myself closer to the computer screen. I'm going to move my microphone here. So we might have some noise, but uh, you'll have to bear, bear with me. I'm going to look at a workout that's uh, three minutes in interval duration. And they are all, by the way, equal recovery uh, to the interval duration. So 95% of VVO2 max at uh, of three minute duration. That's one plotted point. If I then instead go to the 85% curve and I want to find the two minute interval or that corresponds to the same, the same perceived difficulty of the session, uh, then I'm, I'm going to go to the 85% the intensity curve, look at where that plot is. So I have two minutes here and then I need to do 21 of those intervals. I messed up this whole segment, I realized, because I didn't tell you what that previous point, the three minute intervals was on the Y axis. It was, let me look at this again. It was five, I believe. Yes, five, five repetitions at 95% uh, VVO2 max of three minute intervals. That is equally hard to, at 85% of VVO2 max, 21 intervals of uh, two minute duration two minute recovery. So there you go. That's uh, basically your anaerobic threshold compared to just below VVO2 max, maybe 5K, 5K pace. And you can go and have a look at this model. And this is actually on this chart area is also encircled where you can maximize your time at VO2 max, which is brilliant. I, I use this, I've used this a lot. It's changed my coaching uh, when in terms of how I give intervals. So I hope that you can change how you improve and how you make your work as effective by looking at this as well. So the Fibolt model is uh, a real, real, real piece of gold here in this article that I wasn't aware of at all, but now I am and now you are too. So go and check that out in the article. And number 10 on our list is the example program of an Olympic triathlete. And this doesn't mean Olympic distance triathlete, or it does, I guess, but this is an, an athlete that has actually gone to, to the Olympics, an actual program. I don't know who this is. This is somebody who, uh, a, from a coach that the authors have corresponded with when they made this, uh, uh, this article. And if we look at their preparation phase first, so earlier on in the season, they do only three swims per week. So, so not much for, but I guess that's quite early on in the season. All of them are 90 minutes, uh, roughly five kilometers, and all of them includes 30 minutes of intervals. Two of them are long intervals, so longer than one minute, uh, and uh, one of them is short intervals, so shorter than uh, one minute in duration. And uh, then they do one swim technique session as well. And they do one, two, three bikes and one, two, three runs per week in this phase. And one of the bikes is an interval workout, uh, which is uh, four times three minutes at uh, the VO2 max power with three minute recoveries, uh, passive recoveries. And they do one run fart leg workout, with, uh, which is 60 minutes long and uh, with uh, varying terrain. It doesn't give any more details than that. In the competitive season, they move to one, two, three, four, five swims and two of them are pool intervals. One is open water, but not specified if it's intervals or not. The two pool swim intervals are again, 90 minutes, five kilometers, including 30 minutes of intervals. One of them is long intervals. One of them is short intervals. They still do one run interval workouts per week and one bike interval workout per week. The run interval is four to eight times three minutes at VVO2 max with four minute recoveries at 50% of VVO2 max. And the bike is, uh, four to six times five minutes at their 
power at VO2 max with three minute recoveries at 100 watts. Uh, so that's it. That's how Olympic triathletes might be using. Just an example, just a case study, but it might give you some idea. All right, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. You can find the show notes as usual on thattriathlonshow.com. If you have comments or questions, please leave them there. I get too much email and uh, to be honest, I won't really answer individual emails uh, unless you are a coaching client uh, at this point. I will answer comments on the comment section because then I can give information to everybody for everybody to see uh, the way that I do on the podcast as well. But I would spend the entire day in the inbox or on Twitter or on Facebook if I if I responded to to every single question individually. And uh, I wouldn't make any any money to buy food, to put food on the table. So so please, if you have comments, leave them on the show notes page in the comments section. I also have some comments about last week's episode, uh, the case study with uh, Carl Brümmer that I want to uh, basically clarify a few points because this episode, it was very popular, but it also uh, gave rise to big discussions on on social media. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read basically from directly from the newsletter that uh, that I sent out to announce this episode when I can find it. Just give me one second because here I made some clarifications. Okay, so this is what I wrote. This week I'll do something different rather than list the key takeaways from the episode. The reason being that I have received a ton of feedback and questions on social media and elsewhere about this episode they want to address. And then we have a question. Is it better to train less? Can I reduce my training volume and expect these same results? My answer is no, absolutely not. There is no better or worse here, generally speaking. There is only what's better and worse for you, given your athletic background, your goals, your family, career, and your other obligation. Abli- obligations. Hence, this episode is titled Case Study. If we talk very generally, more volume is better, if you do it right and can handle it. That's why you don't see anybody winning Kona on this kind of low training volume. But the key here is that quality, and note that quality doesn't simply mean intensity, trumps quantity no matter the volume. You should only train for 20 hours if you can do it with quality. And the second key is that a lower but sustainable volume that also lets you focus on recovery and nutrition is better than sacrificing those fundamentals for a couple of extra hours of training. Question number two, how important are genetics in this case? My answer is, I would say important. Not everybody could get to an 852 Ironman without the right genetics. But let's not forget that it's not just about training and genetics. Very few athletes are as laser focused on recovery and nutrition as Carl, and this means they are leaving a massive amount of potential time improvements on the table. Genetics is, in my opinion, not a proven fact, the most important on the run. On the bike, you can uh, be really savvy about your position, your aerodynamics, and just be patient and train smart. And that could see a lot of male triathletes reach Carl's level, assuming that they also focus on recovery and nutrition as per above. In swimming, to reach the 55 to 1 hour range uh, that is required to win an Ironman World Championship or, well, place on the podium uh, as a minimum, uh, that so i want to rephrase that you are not guaranteed to place on the podium but with a 55 to one hour swim but that is a requirement i believe to place on the podium in a competitive age group Uh, that is all about technique and or almost all about technique and uh, because this is still far below what elite pool swimmers uh, who can be genetic freaks can do in the uh, in the Ironman, in the open water. So rest assured that reaching a world championship winning level at the age group uh, category in swimming has 0% to do with genetics and 100% to do with training and commitment. You are not, the human potential does not stop there for anybody at 55 minutes to one hour. And the final point that I want to address is, I disagree, less is not more in endurance training. This episode sucked. So my answer to that is, uh, that this is not at all about less is more than you have misunderstood what it's all about. In episode 120, which is uh, Seiler's hierarchy of endurance training needs, I talk about how volume is the most important component of endurance sports success. This has research backing. 
note that this is an individual case study with Carl, and maybe none of this applies to you. On the other hand, some of it may apply to you. If you're stuck and stagnated, you're struggling to fit everything in with your life and training, you have no focus on recovery and nutrition, and you don't have a specific purpose for every single minute that you train, then I think you can apply the, some principles from this episode and start seeing improvements. That does not mean that your weekly training hours should be the exact same as Carl's. It certainly does not mean that you will see the same results as him. Those are some points that I wanted to clarify, and I hope that helps. But thanks you, thank you to everybody who engaged. I really appreciate that the the high level of engagement this episode episode gave. That was uh, really pleasing to see. So uh, if you're on the newsletter, you already saw my uh, response that I just read. But if not, please join because that's where you can get access to additional commentary like this in the future. So that's uh, just go to scientifictriathlon.com and sign up. And uh, one more call to action. If you listen when this comes out on Monday, the 9th of September, you have one day left to give some input on a future episode. Uh, you need to go and like Scientific Triathlon on Facebook, scroll down to a post that is probably the third latest or so, and it is about LCHF, because this is what this episode will be about. I will have an interview with two guests, one that is pro LCHF and one that is a pro a non LCHF uh, approach and if you have questions or topics to bring up for discussion to that debate then please post to that Facebook post in the comments and uh, then of course subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss that episode when it comes out uh, again please uh, go to that Facebook post uh, please don't email me because then I want to keep everything in one place so I won't can't, can't guarantee well I can't guarantee any way that your question will be asked but I will Definitely, if it's a good and relevant question, I will bring it up. Uh, so do post it on Facebook in those comments to uh, hopefully get it asked on the debate that is coming up very, very soon. All right, so that's it. Big thank you to Roka for sponsoring this episode. Roka can be found on roka.com and you can found, find wetsuits, tri suits, swimsuits, buoyancy shorts, sunglasses, even custom fit sunglasses all sorts of performance apparel that is the best in class. And you can get all of that for 20% off when you use the discount code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. And thank you to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. You can take their free online sweat test to learn what your individual electrolyte needs are based on your sweat sodium content and sweat rate. And that is a simple quiz, just a few questions to answer. You don't need to do any measurements or any of that sorts. Go and do that, and then you can get your first box of electrolytes for free with the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.